Hello, everyone. Howdy, howdy. How are you guys doing?
authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. I promise I will try to keep it under five minutes. So two weeks ago, we um, invited our colleagues to a member day hearing so that they could share their ideas for how to make Congress work better for the American people. We heard a lot of great ideas. I think it's clear that there remains a lot of opportunity for us to make some positive change over the next 20 months or so. But one area that really stood out to the members of this committee at our member day hearing was just the various recommendations for improving staff capacity and diversity. I, I'd like to say this is a new issue. It's not. Our colleagues raised similar concerns about staff recruitment and retention and diversity in our member, member day hearing at the start of the 116th Congress. And, and we listened to those concerns and we had several hearings and virtual discussions focused on boosting staff capacity and diversity. In fact, the committee made a number of strong recommendations in this space and I'm proud of the work we did, but that work is far from finished. The staffing recommendations we made in the 116th began to get at some of the challenges staff face, but those challenges are many. And for a bunch of institutional and political reasons, they can be hard to fix. So the irony is that these issues should be easy because if there's anything we can all agree on, it's that our staff are dedicated public servants who deserve the kind of pay and benefits that modern workplaces offer. Our staff choose careers on the Hill despite the long hours and lower pay compared to what they could make in the executive branch or the private sector. They have a relative lack of job security like the members of this committee. They are on a two-year contract with hundreds of thousands of people making the decision about contract extensions. Um, we know that Congress is fortunate though to attract such talented and hardworking staff. And we also know that it's hard to keep them here. I'm afraid if it's gonna keep getting harder unless we figure out how to make Congress a place that not only attracts but holds on to talented staff. So what does all this have to do with professionalizing and enriching the congressional internship and fellowship experience, which is the topic of our hearing today? Well, the answer is everything. Uh, everything because internships are really the main pipeline to a career on the Hill. So many staffers begin their Hill career as interns and it's how you get a foot in the door and begin to work your way up the staffing ladder. I will confess, the summer after my freshman year of college, I served as an intern for a member of Congress for whom I have great affection, for whom I have tremendous respect, and with whom, during my internship, I had very limited interaction. Uh, in fact, the longest I got to spend with him was on my very final day of my internship. Uh, he invited me into his office, and he said, I'm now going to teach you the most important lesson of your internship. And I leaned forward, eager to get his lesson, and he said, there are people in this town who would kill to learn what I'm about to share with you. And I leaned further forward in my chair. And then he opened up his desk drawer. He pulled out a cigar and he said, I'm going to teach you how to light and smoke a cigar. So that was my internship experience. But, you know, listen, we, we, we know that many Hill careers do begin as internships. What we don't know is how many potential Hill careers end because of internships. And that's something we really need to consider. Through no fault of their own, some interns end up with supervisors who are poorly trained at managing. If they're trained at all, there can be a lack of consistency to the work they're given or a lack of clarity around professional goals. Others may feel out of place because they don't see other interns interns who look like them or who share common backgrounds and experience. And these are deterrents to pursuing a career on the Hill. They've all, they're, they're also things we can and should fix. Congress needs to figure out how to recruit interns who reflect the diversity of our constituencies and then provide those interns with an experience that makes them want to pursue a career on the Hill. The same logic applies to fellows. Congress desperately needs the expertise that fellows can provide, but the process of getting them to the Hill can be exceedingly difficult. While rules governing Hill fellowships are necessary, navigating them shouldn't be a deterrent to serving. So streamlining the process for placing fellows and ensuring that their Hill experience is fulfilling will actually help Congress retain fellows. So I'm looking forward to hearing what the experts who are joining us today recommend. This committee is all about good ideas for making Congress a more effective and efficient institution. I think we can learn a lot by listening to people who've done the research and figured out what it takes to make internship and fellowship programs successful. So with that, I'd like to now invite Vice Chair Timmons to share some opening remarks as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both our panels of witnesses for being here today to talk about staffing challenges on Capitol Hill. A robust Capitol Hill internship program is crucial to the success of not only members of Congress, but those young people who make up that program. Many staff here in Congress and some members started out as interns on the Hill. 
I actually was an intern in 2006. I was fortunate enough to uh, transition to a job as a staff assistant, and I was working for them, then Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, and when he uh, decided not to run for office, I actually left the Hill and moved back to South Carolina because pay was just generally abysmal, and it was hard to make ends meet. So um, I know these challenges personally, and I'm, as I'm sure several of you do as well. Um, the internship program has so much potential. It can do so much good, but unfortunately for too many people, internships are an obstacle, not a stepping stone in their career. For years, committees in Congress have talked about staffing challenges. Uh, as far back as 1946, recommendations have been made regarding congressional staff. That just goes to show how hard these institutional challenges are uh, to fix. Attracting talented and hardworking interns and retaining qualified staff is a struggle for many offices on the Hill. I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses today on what recommendations we can work towards to keep that talent here on the Hill. The committee made several recommendations on this topic in the 116th Congress, and I welcome discussion on how we can improve and build upon those recommendations in order to attract and retain qualified and diverse interns and staff. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm looking forward to this hearing and I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Today we have two panels of witnesses. Our first panel features four experts on congressional internships and fellowships, and our second panel feature, features three witnesses who will share best practices and experiences from running successful internship programs off the Hill. Uh, witnesses are reminded that your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes, and without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Our first witness is Dr. James Jones. Dr. Jones is an assistant professor at Rutgers University and a leading expert on congressional staff diversity. He's authored two groundbreaking policy reports on racial representation among congressional staff, including The Color of Congress, which analyzed racial, racial re representation among House interns. Dr. Jones is a former congressional intern or part of a club. Uh, Dr. Jones, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chair Kilmer, Vice Chairman uh, Timmons, and other members of the committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm here because you know a paid congressional internship changed my life. As a CBCF intern, I observed the inner workings of Congress, which provided me with an education on democratic institutions that far surpassed anything I learned as a political science major um, at college. At the same time, I witnessed the shortcomings of Congress as an institution where people of color are underrepresented in the congressional workplace overall and conspicuously absent from top staff positions. This work experience set me along a path to become a sociologist and I've spent my academic career studying how inequality in the congressional workplace is created and maintained and its effects on our democracy. Today, I wanna to talk to you about one dimension of my research and what I believe to be the most important reforms that Congress can adopt to improve racial representation in its workplace collecting the data to necessary to see and fight an inequality. As you know, in 2018, Congress passed legislation to provide a House and Senate offices with allowances for paid internships. I led a research project for pay our interns that investigated who congressional offices paid that first year. Now, sadly, we found that these paid opportunities were unequally distributed along racial lines. In our last report, who Congress pays, we showed that white students were overrepresented amongst paid interns and, white, and black and Latino students were underrepresented. For example, white students make up about 52% of the national undergraduate population, but accounted for about 76% of paid interns. In contrast, black and Latino students make up about 15 and 20% of the undergraduate population, but accounted for 7% and about 8% of paid interns respectively. Now, as you guys have mentioned, uh, these findings are disappointing for many reasons, but chief among them is that we know that internships often lead to paid staff positions and even often uh, lead you to routes to becoming a member of Congress themselves. Paying congressional interns for the labor is an important first step in strengthening congressional capacity. However, as my research indicates, there is still much more work to be done. There's a need to, for more funding to pay interns a living wage and congressional offices should adopt more diverse recruitment practices. However, increasing racial representation amongst congressional interns is not just about resources and recruitment. It's also about establishing and promoting transparent hiring practices. Let me explain how this all works together. As I see it, what sets Congress apart from the many other workplaces that are majority white 
is that congressional workplaces are exempt from many federal workplace laws. These exemptions have made Congress a non-transparent and integral work institution, and they are a key mechanism through which racial inequality is created and maintained. So for example, Congress does not collect demographic data about the racial and gender identities of its workers. Most employers are required by federal law to collect these data, and this is a process which is often a part of new employee onboarding. These demographic data have been an invaluable research, resource for researchers like myself to investigate, investigate the presence of discrimination. But simply, these data help determine racial and gender disparities in pay, promotion, and retention. Now, unfortunately, members of Congress have exempted themselves from these demographic, uh, demographic reporting requirements. This lack of transparency makes the congressional work, workplace a black box where racial inequality is allowed to fester undisturbed. It also deny, uh, denies voters the ability to hold their elected uh, officials accountable for hiring staffers and interns who look like them. As we know, in a democracy, the perspectives of voters is paramount. In order for them to make informed decisions about how they are represented, they are needed, they need information. So this opacity is in a sense, a threat to our democratic process and an attempt for an inclusive and multiracial democracy. Last year, Representative Allegar successfully proposed an amendment to the legislative branch appropriations bill to collect demographic data on all paid house interns as a method of improving transparency and representation. And this is a step in the right direction. However, Congress should go further. It needs to collect and publish demographic data on paid and unpaid interns, as well as fellows, to ensure that these work opportunities are equitably distributed. Data collection should include information about their race and their gender, as well as other important socioeconomic, uh, other factors like socioeconomic status to identify if those who are most economically disadvantaged are able to work in the people's house. Now, to be sure, these data alone will not solve the problem of a unrepresented class of interns and fellows. However, we cannot address this vexing democratic dilemma without it. This information is vital for understanding the scope of the problem, setting benchmarks, and measuring progress. It matters who works in the halls of Congress. It's often said that today's interns are tomorrow's leaders. Today, the highest ranking women in government, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, and Vice President Kamala Harris both began their political careers as congressional interns. It's vital that Congress does everything possible to ensure that the leaders of tomorrow reflect the diversity of this country. To do this, Congress must adopt diverse and transparent hiring practices. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Our second witness is Carlos Vera. Mr. Vera is the co-founder and current executive director of Pay Our Interns. Originally from Colombia, Carlos was raised in California, but moved to Washington, D.C. to attend American University. Uh, while at AU, Carlos was an unpaid intern at the White House, the European Parliament, and the House of Representatives. Uh, Carlos's efforts on Capitol Hill led him to be named a Forbes 30 Under 30 honoree, an Echoing Green Fellow, a Camelback Ventures Fellow, a Top 20 Changemaker by NBC Latino, and an uh, Aspen Ideas Fellow. Uh, Mr. Vera, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, members of the Select Committee, thank you so much for inviting me to testify on this important topic. My name is Carlos Vera, and I'm not only the ED of pay our interns, but I'm also a former unpaid house intern myself. Uh, pay our interns is all about creating equitable pathways so that we have institutions that reflect our great nation. The recent report we released alongside Dr. Jones shows that there's much more work to be done. Uh, students at 10 private universities are disproportionately overrepresented compared to those that go to public schools. We found virtually zero students that attend community colleges. Um, and of course, the racial demographics need to improve. And that's because equity needs to be put at the center of this program. With that being said, Congress should be proud of how far along it's come. In 2017, when pay our interns released our report, it showed that less than 10% of house offices offered paid internships. That number now is over 90%. Here are some recommendations that we believe will strengthen the program. The fund for interns needs to increase. Uh, our data shows that the average stipend for a house intern is about $1,600 for a full internship. That simply is not enough to live an intern in DC. Thankfully, there's an effort by Rep. Adam Smith and Seth Moulton 
that would increase the fund to $40,000. This will allow for stipends to increase closer to $15 an hour. Additionally, uh, the internship fund not only is accessible to personal offices, but also leadership offices. Unfortunately, committees uh, do not have dedicated funding to pay their interns. Uh, and we know that some of the most, you know, memorable enriching ones are in committees. So there's an effort being led by Rep Darren Soto that would provide $70,000 for each committee to pay interns and fellows. We also believe that you need to broaden uh, recruitment. The reason why top schools and those in DC are overrepresented uh, in the intern population is because those schools have large endowments, they have resources, they have buildings and you know, staff that, in, that basically make sure that their students get these opportunities. Uh, state schools, community colleges, MS, MSI simply cannot compete. Uh, that's why we believe that it's important, you know, look at your district. If you have a community college, if you have a tribal college, reach out, partner with the career center, uh, with the political science department, do a quick 20, 30 minute webinar. That will make a huge difference. And beyond that, it's also about um, equitable access and transparency. I was at the college in Wisconsin encouraging students to apply, and one of them got on their website um, of their member, and they raised their hand, and you know they show their phone, and it, the member's website stated that all their internships weren't paid, even though I personally knew that they did pay some interns. Uh, believe it or not, that's a huge deterrent for a lot of folks. The single factor deciding whether they apply or not is, can I afford to come to DC? So we highly encourage offices, you know, you don't have to put how much money because I get that it fluctuates, but at least putting that a stipend available really um, incentivize, you know, working class youth to apply for these positions. Especially since our studies show that 90% of house offices either don't mention pay or mention all their internships aren't paid. Additionally, we believe in expanding remote access. Current house rules only allow for interns to telework during pandemics and other emergencies, we believe it should be permanent. Uh, Rep Jayapal and Omar have are leading the push to make this permanent, uh, and this will allow folks that you know could intern from their home in Idaho, Texas, or wherever in the country. We believe that the committee should look at creating an intern support office. Once a fund was created, over 80 offices reached out for help. Right, because we know a lot of inter coordinators are just a year older than interns and have other uh, responsibilities. By having an office dedicated to this, it could really be a game changer. And the last one is looking at housing. Uh, there is an empty dormitory building used for the now defunct house page program. It's no longer being used, and you know Congress should consider using that for working class youth. And you know most importantly, looking at increasing the MRA. Um, our work will be futile if interns become staffers and they have to quit because they can't afford to live in DC. And lastly, I'm you know very encouraged because in a time of depolarization, the fact that Republicans and Democrats have come together to work on this gives me hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vera. Um, next, we'll hear from Audrey Henson. Ms. Henson founded College to Congress in 2016, a nonprofit dedicated to creating a more diverse, inclusive, and effective Congress by empowering the next generation of public servants after being inspired by her experience landing and navigating her first congressional internship. A Pell Grant student, Ms. Henson had to work two part-time jobs and take out student loans to afford the opportunity to intern for free in Congress and later became a full-time staffer. A college to Congress is disrupting the pipeline of congressional staff and systematically changing the way our laws are written by helping students from rural, low-income, and disadvantaged backgrounds secure full-time internships in Congress and covering the actual cost of an unpaid internship. Uh, Ms. Henson, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chairman Timmons, members of the committee staff, and of course, good afternoon, interns. Uh, thank you for having me back here today to provide some recommendations on how we can improve congressional internships. My name is Audrey Henson, and I'm the founder and CEO of College to Congress, a nonprofit I started in 2016 to systemically change Congress by empowering a diverse, inclusive, and effective generation of public servants. I'm here before you today to deliver some innovative and out-of-the-box solutions that I think Congress can adopt pretty quickly to start to fix this problem that quite honestly is having a profound, a profound negative effect, uh, not only in your offices here in Washington, but also back home in your districts. 
Uh, as we all know and have agreed today, internship opportunities are the hallmark of a member of Congress's tenure. We know that a congressional internship often leads to a job on the Hill, a uh, career in public service, and at times uh, can inspire a run for future political office. But what about the vast majority of interns who end up going back home to the district? Although that internship impacted that one student, it shouldn't have ended there. The knowledge and the skills that they learned in our nation's leading institution should have an exponential ripple effect inspiring dozens, if not hundreds, to become more civically engaged and have a more favorable view on Congress. To encourage this outcome, we must ensure that internships are meaningful, that they're engaging, that they're overwhelmingly a positive experience. And you're gonna to get to do that by guaranteeing that interns have the training they need to succeed in streamlining the application process. To guarantee that interns are adequately trained and to succeed on day one of that internship and make sure it's right for them, we're recommending a public-private partnership with College to Congress so that we can provide training and resources before they even arrive in Washington. Each office has the sole responsibility of shaping their own internship programs and equipping interns with skills that lead to future uh, professional and personal success. But what if that office is unable to provide that world-class experience we all strive for? We all know what it's like to have an intern coordinator who has way more work than they have time to do. Maybe it's a probe season and the ledge staff doesn't have much one-on-one -on -one time. Well, that's why we think Congress desperately needs to standardize training for all incoming interns before they even arrive. So far, College to Congress has trained more than 800 prospective interns on our own curriculum, C2C University. Our, cor our coursework teaches interns the ins and outs of Congress, uh, everything from answering the phones to even introducing legislation so that they're ready to serve your office and your constituents on their very first day. C2C University prepares them for a successful and meaningful experience and helps students decide beforehand if they actually want to invest their career on Capitol Hill and spend their summer and sometimes even their savings trying to figure out what they want to do with their life. Uh, as you can imagine, training them beforehand is going to have the added benefit of creating a better experience and match with your office as well. We recommend that Congress engages in a public-private partnership with College to Congress to equip prospective and current interns uh, with the skills they need to be successful in your office and beyond. So much like the actual internship program, the application process is also a logistical nightmare for students and offices. Each office has a different requirement and dates that vary from office to office, making it challenging to find the right fit. One straightforward solution to help fix this problem would be for the House to adopt a standard application that all offices would use that makes it more accessible as well for interns to apply and to figure out where they should go intern. This common application would ask basic demographic questions, include written answers, like why they wanna intern, what policy issues they're interested in and what leadership management style they prefer. A standard application ensures the interns are matched with the right offices and they participate in the most meaningful opportunities available. It also streamlines the process of you finding your constituents who are interested in coming up and interning. Uh, congressional districts, your office up here would all benefit from this common application. Members of Congress have an obligation to their constituents to provide a world-class opportunity that benefits not only their office, but also their communities back home. An internship can serve as a gateway to a career on Capitol Hill, but for those who take their talents elsewhere, we should strive to leave a lasting impact that shapes the future of so many more that don't make it to Capitol Hill. We all agree that interns deserve to be paid more and that we should expand the availability of remote internships, but what good does that do if they aren't meaningful? We at College to Congress strongly believe that Congress can provide these meaningful opportunities with relative ease by first creating this public-private partnership with us, second, creating a common application that the house offices all use, and third, ensuring that every opportunity is truly meaningful. I'm more than happy to dig into your questions and provide more detail on how this can be achieved. And of course, partner with your offices to ensure that you're providing meaningful opportunities that are sure to last a lifetime and not just a semester. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Henson. And our final witness on this panel is Travis Moore, founder and director of Tech Congress. Previously, Mr. Moore was the legislative director for Representative Henry Waxman, the former chairman and ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee who had jurisdiction over wide ranging matters of technology policymaking. He has launched a number of programs to build human capital and improve technological capacity inside and outside of Congress, including the first congressional digital communications training program in Congress. Mr. Moore, you are now recognized for five minutes. Wonderful. Well. Um... Thank you, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chairman Timmons, and uh, esteemed members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I I'm the founder of Tech Congress, and we're a startup nonprofit placing computer scientists, engineers, and other technologists as uh, policy advisors to members of Congress through our Congressional Innovation Fellowships. Technology is reshaping society and Congress and its work in fundamental ways and with increasing speed. But many of our, breasts, uh, our, our brightest and most creative problem solvers with hugely relevant tech and national security experience who want to serve their country in Congress simply can't make it through the front door of Capitol Hill. I founded Tech Congress because I needed it when I was a staffer. In 2013, the House was voting on the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. Uh, this was a tough vote for my then boss, Representative uh, Henry Waxman. Um, and in order to make an, an informed vote recommendation, I was trying to understand a few technical concepts. Uh, what's personally identifiable information? What did it mean to anonymize data? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you and all of your staffs have been in that exact situation. You have a tough vote in front of you and you're trying to understand the concepts so that you can make the best decision. Well, I searched uh, for staff within Congress that could help me walk through my questions but I found that there weren't staff on Capitol Hill with the necessary tech expertise to help me. As a result, I went outside of the building to a tech company lobbyist for advice. And that is because out of the 3,500 legislative staff serving in Congress, at my best estimate, there are fewer than 20 with meaningful uh, training and backgrounds in technology. Now, why is that? Uh, it's not for lack of supply. We've, we've had 865 technologists apply for our programs over the last year, some of whom were willing to take six-figure pay cuts to work in Congress. Uh, and importantly, these are candidates that come from communities vastly underrepresented in Congress, including underrepresented people of color, women, and veterans. Uh, in fact, nearly 25% of our fellows to date are veterans. Over 43% are people of color, uh, which I'm extraordinarily proud of. We are the first organization in Washington or, or uh, politics to offer a referral award for women, underrepresented people of color, and veterans to join our program. Um, but the core staffing challenge for Capitol Hill is that the pipeline that feeds staffing roles have not evolved to meet the needs of the institution and the country. If you are a technologist with professional experience that wants to serve your country in Congress, there is no clear entryway for you. Fellowships can help solve that problem, however. And, and here's the good news. We are making progress on building tech capacity in Congress um, while supporting the incredibly hardworking and under-resourced staff on Capitol Hill. First, Congress is hiring technical staff, including a number of our alumni. We're proud to see this incremental progress and we need much more. Second, Congress is creating tech talent pipelines. Senators Cotton and Shaheen authored the Technology and National Security Fellowship Program as part of defense appropriations in 20, uh, tw defense authorization in 2020. This fellowship is a joint program between DOD and Congress and the first cohort of recent STEM grads will arrive on Capitol Hill this fall. Third, uh, we had a team of fellows that were able to pilot the bipartisan proposal from Leader Hoyer and Leader McCarthy for a congressional digital service on this very committee. And we are so, so grateful uh, for your hosting of our team. And fourth, uh, fellowships are building bipartisan uh, working relationships. We've had great ideological diversity in our program. Uh, fellows end up being frequent collaborators in an institution where, uh, let's, let's be frank, bipartisan relationships are increasingly on the wane. Uh, but we can do more. And I'd like to highlight um, uh, a few recommendations for how Congress can better invest in and support fellowship programs. First, Congress should expand the two fellowship programs it already funds and operates, the Technology and National Security Fellowship and the Wounded Warrior Fellowship Program. Because so many veterans have significant technical expertise from their time in military service, expanding these programs would have the dual benefit 
of meeting the need for both national security and technical talent. Um, in addition, Congress should encourage other committees, including Energy and Commerce, Veterans Affairs, to follow the lead of Hask and SASC and create parallel fellowship uh, program pipelines for STEM grads to enter Congress in those agencies. And uh, finally, Congress should improve how it supports fellowship programs, including by creating a central registration uh, system for fellows and detailees, developing training opportunities with CRS and the new staff academy, uh, creating opportunities to network and gather like exist for summer interns, and working with OPM to help presidential management fellows learn about opportunities to serve in Congress. So thank you for having me and for all the hard work of the committee to date, and uh, I look forward to questions. Thank you, Mr. Moore, and way to stick the landing on the five minutes. Um, we're now going to move to questions. Um, the order I have is myself, and then Vice Chair Timmons, then Mr. Cleaver, then Mr. Davis, then Mr. Perlmutter, and then Mr. Phillips, um, and then we'll slot folks in if they show up afterwards. Um, uh, so let me start by just recognizing myself for five minutes. I want to start um, with Mr. Vera. Your, your, your report found that 92.5% of representative uh, use the allowance that um, is provided to pay interns. This isn't coming out of members' budget. So why do you think that number isn't 100%? Uh, you know, in, in doing the research for your reports on, on Hill internships, were you able to discern why some personal offices still have unpaid internships? And what explanation do offices have for that? So uh, Chairman, you bring up a great point. The way that appropriators created this fund was you know, separate from the MRA, right? Um, you use it, it doesn't count against it. It doesn't count against your cap. So there really is no reason not to use it. What we've noticed is I think one is that old belief of, oh, you know, my constituents will be proud that I sent some money back to the treasury, I guess. <laughs> or which really doesn't make sense. Or the second I think is um, some offices don't really know how to access it or just have a lot of questions around it, which I think kind of goes to support. And then I think third is, I think it's, it's a minority, but some offices don't really see it as valuable. And we're obviously, you know, trying to change that. Do you think there's recommendations this committee could make to get that number a little closer to 100%? Well, you know, I think it wouldn't hurt because um, I know that the CEO is tracking by quarter you know, how much each money, you know, each office is using, reaching out and kind of trying to get a sort of discussion as, as to why they're not using it. Uh, because like you said, there really is no reason not to use it. Um, Mr. Moore, I, I wanted to follow up with you as well. So um, did the fellows in your program by and large go on to careers in Congress and um, can you discuss just some of the barriers they may run into when trying to start their career in Congress after a fellowship? Sure, yeah. So we explicitly select for folks that do want to start their careers in Congress. And again, I, there, are, there are hundreds and hundreds of, of folks coming from Silicon Valley or, or the tech industry that wanna do this work. And it's a question of creating a pathway for them. Most want to stay, but it's hard. I mean, Congress is an incredibly competitive workplace. I will say what makes it harder are some of the, you know, Congress is sort of unique in, in how untransparent it is about some of its hiring. I was looking at the House job board yesterday and read a position that said something like senior Democrat is seeking highly energetic, motivated, organized staffer. Um, in no other world or industry, say you're Google, are you gonna post a, a big tech company looking for engineer to do engineering roles? Um, we need more transparency in the hiring process. Um, and I do think that there are other, other things that Congress could do, like um, uh, trainings through the Staff Academy, um, gatherings modeled on the, the summer intern series that would help with fellows. I want to ask the same question uh, that I asked to, to Mr. Vera, though, Travis. The, the, um, so if, particularly with regard to the posting that you, that you um, shared, so if you're this committee, are there particular recommendations that we could make to, to address this? So I would say, um, I don't know whether you can mandate that, that members name who they're, the member that they're hiring for when they're in, introducing job postings. Uh, I think that would, that would help. I, we, I saw on our Slack yesterday around a specific job, a dozen messages for folks trying to just figure out which member was hiring for a tech staffer. Um, so I think that's one. Um, I think having a centralized 
job board that's that's independent of party. I know each 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 caucus has their own job board, but if you go to health.gov and the clerk's office, it's not there. Uh, the clerk's office that that website says call the clerk or show up to the Ford building if you want a list of recent recent vacancies. Um, and I also think investing in HR software um, that's available to all of your teams uh, that helps you sort through applications. I know when we got you know applications for roles, we get 500 applications. You need the tools to help you sort through those. Those are things that the institution could invest in and make available to offices. Terrific. Um, let me uh, yield back the remainder of my time. Uh, Vice Chair Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, uh, Mr. Vera, we are updating our website right now to say that we offer competitive intern pay. Um, I looked on our website and I literally, I was like, well, this is an easy fix. So thank you for that. Um, it's, it's getting updated right now. Um, I also wanted to ask you, so you're, all these numbers are hard to get because, you know, I guess there's an assumption that interns are working 40 hours a week, maybe 40 plus on a full session week, or maybe less on weeks that um, were not in session. Um, and then obviously the pandemic creates some challenges because nobody's in the office. So um, you referenced a number, 92% were using the uh, fund for interns in DC and you referenced a quarter system. What quarter was that? So the, what we looked at was a payroll records um, from from July to September of 2019. We did not do last year because of the pandemic. And we did not think that'd be fair to members because we, we knew that there were definitely some uh, hiccups there. Um, and, that's and, and, I, and I think, thank you, thank you. And I think, and this is to Dr. Joe's point, I mean, we really don't have good metrics for a lot of these things. We don't have good ways to track it. I mean, you know, if you're paying somebody 16, and I've been texting with my chief of staff and my deputy chief of staff about this because I, I have to admit I do, um, defer to them on a lot of this, but, um, you know, if, if you're paying them $1,600, dollars a month, but they're not working 40 hours a week, there's kind of this question there. And then, I mean, I don't know, it, it's very complicated. So I guess a standardized approach to this to where it's not a, a, a bulk pay if we, if we went hourly, but again, that's not how it's done right now. So I, I guess there's some standardization. So we're all using the same kind of language about this. And, you know, Dr. Jones, to your point, I mean, I can't believe that we in 2021 are not tracking, um, you know, diversity data as it relates to hirings and internship. And, you know, the methodology, I, I know that they, it was very painstaking to, to actually create the data that, that you're referencing, but the methodology is still imperf imperfect. So like, I guess the question becomes, um, and, you know, maybe instead of creating the transparency that you're you're referencing, and I would be in favor of it, um, but I can understand certain people might not. But what do you think about anonymizing it to where we're more talking about Congress as a whole, as opposed to getting something that a member could potentially have a gotcha moment, or maybe an easier thing to do would be to anonymize the data just, just so we can say the House as a whole. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think this is a good point. And this is actually the way that I think about this personally, um, because I actually think it's an institutional problem. It's not one particular member of Congress, right? And so I think there's uh, various ways in which you could present the data. Um, but like, I think the question is like, I think we have a lot of questions and like, as a researcher, there's a lot we actually just don't know because of this data, right? So it's, if I can go back to your point that you just brought up, um, just coming up with these figures. So one is us getting uh, this data um, that's not available, but then it's using the data that the House actually and the Senate does provide. Um, and it's a really a little bit complicated. Um, it's all about how um, staff are paid and this data is reported. So for instance, we looked at, um, uh, that first year, this um, the House um, implemented this policy from April 2019 to September, and so that's where you get our averages about um, the uh, the average stipend. So in the House, I believe it was around $1,600, and that's for about six weeks. Now to get that, like you, what the House reports is their person, the intern's first and last name, their office, and um, their pay. Um, so there's this wide variation. And in some instances, the data is actually really bad because you sometimes a office will um, 
input that a, a large chunk of money for just one day of work or one week of work, right? And so it's this, this really complicated um, and not standardized way of how employees are being paid. And like, we don't know how many hours, right? So this is just upon like a yeah. length of time. Well, so on that I, question. I'm, I'm with you, let me finish up. I don't wanna go over my time. I, I feel like there might be an opportunity to use technology to create a portal where we can standardize all this information, gather the data, and maybe even do some more standardized onboarding. Um, I mean, I know every office has to deal with onboarding. So if, if there was a, a, a portal that put all of this information into, and then we could learn from it and it could be more uh, instructive of what policies we need going forward, that may be helpful. Mr. Chair, I'm not gonna go over, I yield back, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Timmons. Uh, next up, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, I want to follow the rules. Uh, Perlmutter and uh, Davis don't have on ties. Um, I, I think, I mean, that's probably interfering with our ability to get interns. I, <clears throat> um, but I, I leave that to the two people in charge and, 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 and proceed. Uh, thank you uh, for, for being here, uh, all of the witnesses uh, to, uh, today. Um, and you, you made some very interesting comments. So, and I, one of the things uh, I, want, I want to follow up on, I, I think it was Mr. Vera who, who, made, who said this, uh, about 12 years ago, my daughter was an intern in, in Kit Bond's office on the Senate side. She stayed at the Johnson uh, dorm, I, I think it was called Johnson, uh, um, uh, and uh, it cost $800 a month. So, we, uh, my wife and I actually had to pay for her to be an intern. Uh, you know, eight hundred dollars a month for the, 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 uh, the, the rent, uh, and then we had to pay for, you know, what, what her living uh, cost. And 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 uh, I, I think that that kind of thing is, is probably discouraging people from from wanting wanting to do it unless they come from, you know, uh, families that are. Uh, you know, well off, uh, and most of and most of them are not. Are not, are not. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, what what amount of money, uh, Ms. Henson, um, uh, all of you, Mr. Vera, Mr. Moore, what amount of money do you think would be um, would be acceptable and um, and actually realistic for an intern to be in Washington uh, each month. But can you, I know it, it'll be a guess, but I, I want to find out how close uh, I'm thinking to what, what, what reality is. Uh, it's a great question, uh, Congressman. I, when we've like looked at the last four years of what we have to provide to support our interns, it ends up being about $1,600, $1,700 a month. You have to take into account DC rent, professional clothing, food, their flight to and from Washington. Um, that, that can break down a couple different ways. I think one of the easiest places to start is to match DC minimum wage. They're working in DC and they're not even making the DC minimum wage here. And so that could be one easy place to just start right away. Yeah, that's that's really embarrassing. Uh, if, I mean, we're in a in the district and not even uh, honoring the law. Uh, anybody else with a, something that that would be dramatically different? I would go as around like almost about five thousand dollars, right? And this is what we talked about in our report from Congress pays. Um, and thinking about you know just living expenses, housing. I think eight hundred dollars is actually pretty cheap uh, in DC. Um, it's the 10th most expensive metropolitan area. Um, but I think we can look at other programs, you know, programs like the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation or the Congressional Hispanic Institute. So for their internship programs in the summer, which are about six to eight weeks, they are paying um, a stipend of about $3,000 to $3,500. They're also providing um, uh, housing for free. So that, that would get you to like the $5,000 mark. But we're also thinking about um, transportation um, to and from DC. And also if we're thinking about 
um, socio socioeconomic status. You know, when I first interned in Congress, I had to buy a whole bunch of suits because um, I never worked in a professional workplace uh, ever. So I think we also think about the just the different costs that interns have to um, incur to do this work. And one last point, often if they want to count this towards college, the college will charge them to, uh, as college credit, right? So there's another uh, a cost upon doing this internship. Yeah, we also had to pay, we we had a we operated a full time school, and uh, Congressman Davis probably will may may even know some of the costs. I mean, we we had to run a school for the interns. I mean, like a, a full time uh, school with with, with uh, credits and so forth. Uh, so the cost probably went up significantly, but uh, they were not they were not paid. One one final question, Mr. Chairman, uh, and and that is, uh, the the interns uh, stayed in the building. Uh, I know it was empty last year, um, and it would seem to me that if, it, if we're continuing to uh, allow that building to just sit there, we're, we're destroying the building by not using it. Uh, so I, I, whatever, whatever we make, a, whatever we recommend, uh, I, I think it has to include that building, if for no other reason than uh, being good stewards of, of the taxpayers' uh, dollars. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver. I'm not sure if anyone wants to respond to Mr. Cleaver's final point there. I was just uh, going to say that, you know, we did a survey to interns asking what's the number of thing they care about. And wasn't even pay, pay was the second, it was housing. And I really think like to your point, if you're using that building, it could really be a game changer because too many people are taking out student loans to do public service internships. And that's just ridiculous. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, next up, Mr. Davis. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Perlmutter, for joining me in the Tylus, uh, the Tylus Caucus today. Uh, always great to see my good buddy Emmanuel too. Hey, look, the, what's great about this committee is we want to work together, and you know I think a lot of great recommendations. And and I'm so glad, Carlos, you mentioned we're actually moving in the right direction when it comes to Congress and and internship opportunities. You know, up until a few years ago, and up until this committee started talking uh, even further about congressional internships. Uh, you, had to, you had to take it paid interns out of your MRA and out of your headcount that we're limited to. I mean, there are ideas that we ought to be able to put together to make sure that there could be DC-based interns, district-based interns. Uh, the cost of living clearly is much different in Washington, DC than it is in one of my district offices. And we have to also take that into consideration. But the elephant in the room right now that no one's talking about is we can have all these great ideas about internships. We can have all this, this, this great knowledge that a lot of us have and being able to work at a younger age in and around Washington, DC, getting that experience with Derek. I, I don't know if you still smoke cigars after you learn from your, your former uh, boss as an intern, uh, but you know what? We don't have DC open right now. No intern in Washington, DC or in our district office is getting the same experience that every one of us and all of you are talking about right now, not one. So we've got to also lead on this committee about getting our Congress reopened again. There is absolutely zero need to open a housing, a, a, a place of housing for interns right now when they're not even, when we don't even have Congress open again. We don't have them giving tours. We don't have them talking about we don't have them talking about what it's like to work in and around this institution because they're not there. Visitors aren't there. So we would like your help in actually working to make sure that we can get some of these plans put in place before interns come back onto campus so that we are ready to hit the ground running when they do. But unless the majority works with this committee, works with us to be able to find a plan to reopen the campus, um, we may be getting ahead of ourselves. And, and frankly, I think a lot of the testimony reveals of the status that we are in right now is not helpful to getting those experiences that many need to be able to make this a career. Good news is we've got a lot of opportunity here with uh, student loan repayment programs that has actually kept people in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm open ears to suggestions about increases to headcount, increases to off MRA, 
funds available for interns, but at the same time, we also can't price ourselves out of opportunities that would work in and around our district. Um, I'm interested to hear what any of the witnesses have to say about the current COVID status we're in in Washington right now, and how that would impact any of your ideas. Congressman, I appreciate this question so much because when I was speaking about the meaningfulness of internships, this is exactly why. Pre-COVID, as you know, you're a former staffer, interns were constituent facing. They were doing tours, they were answering phone calls, they were working in the front office. And while we're proud and happy to have helped 226 offices start virtual internships, and we do want to keep them because it keeps Congress accessible. We don't want that to be the status quo because what we're hearing from both these offices and these internships is it's not as meaningful. They're not learning as much. They're not able to interact with the member. They're not able to interact with staff. And if we want to be able to make sure, again, that this internship has a lasting impact, that they're gonna go back to your district, say great things about Congress, say great things about their time with you, then we need to get them here and show them how it operates. I think we can all agree, there is an energy about Capitol Hill and about our, our unique perspective to all wanna to work together to change certain policy issues to help America. And we're not seeing that play out virtually. So I agree, we need to find a way to open, to safely bring interns back uh, and to ensure that they're doing some sort of capstone program. So they need something they can walk away with. Maybe it's communications focused where they get to draft a press release or a tweet. It could be policy focused where they do a deep dive on an issue that is unique to your district. Uh, it could even be operations focused. We all know schedulers and chiefs make everything run on time. So we would encourage those two things, reopen, do it in a safe way, but let's also make sure that we have some sort of capstone project the intern can walk away and use to get hired in the next job and say, this is what I did when I got to intern in Congress. Mr. Chair, I think I'm out of time, but I, I agree with everything you said and I appreciate the witnesses. Thanks for the opportunity to be on. Lastly, I think it's imperative too that part of this process is we get back to our committees. And instead of doing these virtually, let's get back to, to uh, doing face-to-face -face, uh, and giving people and future interns the opportunities they deserve. So I yield back no time that I have, Derek. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Next up, Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Timmons, um, and to our witnesses. I, I love this hearing because I'm one of those who would never be a member of Congress now if I wasn't an intern for Senator Patrick Leahy back in 1989, 30 years ago, which either makes him really old or me really young. So I'm going to go with the latter uh, today. But, um, you know, actually, you know, this is too important. There we go. Just, to, just in case anybody was, you know, going to do a little bit of due diligence on me. Um, but, you know, a lot has changed since 1989, and a lot hasn't. Uh, interns are still underpaid, underdeveloped, and while I think it's fair to say that they surely represent the geographic and political diversity of the country, uh, they do not re reflect the economic and racial diversity of the country. Uh, Mr. Vera, I'd love to start with you and two questions. You know, how can we be more proactive uh, and intentional uh, about identifying and recruiting high potential interns from around the country? Uh, and if you could answer that, and along with uh, a little bit more information about your House Intern Resource, resource Office. Uh, my colleagues and I are intrigued by that, and we'd love uh, to learn a little bit more. Uh, thank you, Rep. Phillips. Actually, we met with uh, Chairman Leahy two years ago, and he's been paying interns, I think, since the 70s. And over, I think, like half of his staff currently started, started off as his interns, which I think says a lot about him. Um, and then to your second point, a lot of it is kind of like what I said about reaching out to the community colleges and uh, minority student institutions and HBCUs in your district. There's also like, there's a society for, you know, Black Political Scientists Association. There's all these organizations that you can really reach out to um, and they get excited about these opportunities. The problem we have right now is, you know, many offices are over, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of going on. Staff have a lot uh, to do 
And what happens is you just put it on your website, maybe you send it to one or two colleges uh, and you have these schools, right? Like Ivy Leagues and everything, they have the resources and they make sure that their students apply, get the resume and all that. Uh, meanwhile, you know, I, I spoke at an HBCU in Texas and after I spoke to the students, the director came up to me and he said, do you wanna know how many staff I have? I said, I don't know, five or 10. He said, you're looking at him. He said, I have 9,000 students. The majority are first generation Pell Grant recipients. Their parents don't have those networks and they're going to school that can't give them the resources to compete with a Harvard or Stanford. So I, I really do think it's doing that intentional outreach um, to these specific schools and organizations. And can you talk a little more about your house intern resource office? Yes, apologies for that. So this idea has been going around, I think for a minute, uh, because I don't think it's all about simply about money and, you know, and, and some resources. I really do think that, it, you know, it comes down to a lot of offices have a lot of questions about internships and you can get really into like the minutia of it. And just having that, you know, small office, maybe two, three people that folks can reach out to, right? Because right now it's house admin and they themselves have a lot of work to do, you know? And I think that's part of the reason why there is a delay for this whole program, right? Like the funds were supposed to be available January, 2019. It weren't available until almost April of that year. So just having that office, I believe Rep Tony Cardenas is the one that really is thinking about this. Um, you have folks from Demand Progress that came up also with this idea. Um, but I just think having that group kind of like that diverse inclusion office that could just be there to answer any questions. So one quick example, a lot of offices don't know that if you pay an intern at least $100 a month, they're considered an employee and can benefit from travel uh, benefits. That's a game changer for a lot of people. So yeah. I appreciate it. And by the way, I'm going to have to go check uh, my 1989 tax return to see if Senator Leahy paid me. I don't, if he did, it was about $3 <laughs> a week. <laughs> Nonetheless, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jones, I don't, I don't have much time left. Maybe quickly, if you could talk about the idea, a silver lining of COVID was our ability in my office to attract a lot more interns who never would have been able to uh, come to Washington, surely, uh, because of the remote and virtual uh, context. Do you think that's something that we should be thinking about and institutionalizing uh, as we move forward to broaden our reach and for those who can't physically make it to Washington to include them as well? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as someone who worked in Washington, I think it's, there's something magic about being in the buildings. Um, but I think we should work on a variety of ways of making Congress accessible, right? So, you know, I work in my district office as well. And, you know, I learned firsthand what it means to be a uh, consistent with like, to do constituent services, right? Um, I think there are some challenges to remote learning. And so I, I personally wouldn't recommend that in the long term without Congress doing the necessary work to make sure that these internships are of as high quality um, as they would get in person. And just if I could add one more thing, um, mention what uh, Rep Davis said about uh, bringing people back to Capitol Hill is that I think there's definitely a need about data transparency as I was talking about, but also just measuring if interns are satisfied with their internships, if, if they're learning. And this is not something that, you know, needs to be reported to the public, but this could be something that is held internal data um, with an intern office or with diversity like inclusion office. Um, and you could actually incentivize offices who perform really well on these indexes of, you know, providing a high quality internship. Well, thank you. I know I'm out of time. I was going to ask Audrey about uh, bipartisanship, but I'm going to have to move on. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Um, unless any of my colleagues have any further questions for this first panel, I don't see anyone waving at me or proposing landing the plane. We will, uh, we will thank this panel of witnesses. Thank you all for sharing your time and your insights, and we will proceed to our second panel. Um, if we can get them elevated onto the Zoom. Uh, so our first witness of our second panel is Emily Hashimoto, Director of Career Content at Idealist.org. Ms. Hashimoto came to Idealist in 2012 with a background in political campaigns, fundraising, advocacy, and higher education. She oversees the way Idealist supports organizations and helps to create new tools that support the nonprofit sector as a whole. Ms. Hashimoto, you are now recognized for five minutes to share your testimony. 
Thank you. Uh, Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the Select Committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, again, my name is Emily Hashimoto, and I work at Idealist, a nonprofit organization founded in 1995 to inspire, connect, and support the social impact sector. Our primary platform, Idealist.org, hosts jobs, internships, and volunteer opportunities posted by over 100,000 nonprofit organizations and government agencies. We serve over 1 million members with a, a wide range of professional experience and interests. Our community is also racially diverse with 20% of users identifying as Asian, 20% identifying as Black, and 12% identifying as Hispanic. As the committee seeks to improve the quality of congressional internships, what I share today is the cumulative wisdom of over two decades of devoted concentration on attracting top talent, what makes work meaningful, and how to inspire others to do their absolute best. So our first recommendation is drafting a compelling internship listing. Finding great interns starts with a great listing. We recommend that hiring managers make explicit where the intern will physically do their work, whether it's in person, remote for now, permanently remote, and so forth. This is particularly important, of course, in this time of pandemic. Um, we also recommend including a description of what interns can expect to get out of this educational experience, like participation in an important event or credit for contributing to a major project. We recommend only including role requirements in the listing. As you may know, potential candidates may take themselves out of the running, especially Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, women, and other traditionally marginalized groups. If they have, for example, everything a listing asks for except one thing that can be taught on the job, candidate pools are typically larger, richer, and more diverse when using this tactic. Uh, and we, we also recommend uh, requesting a sample task as a part of the application, like answering an email from a fictional constituent. This is a great tool in learning very quickly which candidates are the most qualified and engaged. Um, next, we recommend diversifying advertisement. To reach a larger audience and further diversify the candidate pool, we recommend sharing opportunities broadly and outside of traditional networks. So posting on our site, for example, on idealist.org or internships.com or developing relationships with local colleges and universities. Um, next, and this is a big one already been discussed, pay interns for their work. Offering compensation enables interns to dedicate more time and focus to their internship as they're less likely to seek out additional part-time work to meet their financial needs. Compensating interns will bring offices more candidates of diverse backgrounds and may ultimately broaden the talent pipeline to the Hill. The practice of offering unpaid internships can unfairly advantage people who can afford to provide their time and labor for free, thereby providing less access to those who cannot. I offer my own story. As someone who had three unpaid internships in college, I'm grateful for those experiences, but I'm deeply aware that the opportunities I was able to apply for and accept were only an option because my family could afford it. Not everyone is as fortunate. Finally, we recommend managing with intention. Since interns usually have a longer learning curve due to less professional experience, managing them can be a tall order. Those managing interns may need more resources or strategies to fully support their new hires. Specific plans to try to ensure for a fruitful work experience for interns include collaborating with interns to set goals, offering support through weekly meetings, and sharing resources and examples of past projects. Inviting interns to meetings with other staff or partners, as well as to events and presentations providing staff for interns to talk about their career goals and interests. And finally, at the end of the internship, conducting an exit interview to reflect on management practices and internship programming. Interns will feel heard, but more than that, offices will have a lot to gain from this vital feedback. Uh, well, we have a lot to say on this topic. It's something we put into practice at Idealist, best exemplified by our Director of Career Programming, Kevin Kennedy, who started off eight years ago as an intern. He says that his Idealist internship was the best one he ever had. It wasn't just about getting paid. Kevin felt supported by his manager. He felt like he was a part of the team, invited to lunches and meetings. He was offered exposure into the details and the inner workings of the program. He wasn't just the intern. He had real responsibilities and ownership over his work. All of this made him care deeply, and he wanted to be there every day, a choice he continues to make almost nine years later. It behooves all of us who already work in social impact, who spend our work days reaching for a better good, to pave the way for others to join us. Younger voices, traditionally marginalized voices, people who also want to build a better world but don't have the lived experience or connections that enable people like me and many of you here to move from fulfilling internships into careers that matter. Again, thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, um, Ms. Hashimoto. Uh, our second witness is Amiko Matsumoto, Senior Executive 
coach and facilitator at the Partnership for Public Service, where she leads talent management and organizational culture efforts to ensure the partnership continues to be a great place to work. She's run community service and service learning programs in higher education, managed grants, led an agency-wide strategic initiative as a federal employee, and served on local and national boards. Ms. Matsumoto, you are now recognized for five minutes to share your testimony. Thank you. Chair Kilmer, Vice Chair Timmons, and members of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, thank you for the opportunity to join you today and for your time and attention to make Congress work better. My name is Amiko Matsumoto, and I do oversee the internship program for the Partnership for Public Service. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to making the federal government more effective for the American people. I'm pleased to highlight three elements of our intern program that help provide quality work experiences and growth for interns and benefit the partnership as well. For context, we recruit interns through Handshake, which is an online platform designed to democratize opportunities and other networks as well, including Idealist. Uh, as a result, we hire interns from a broad range of colleges and universities across the country. We have three cohorts of interns per year. A group of approximately 20 interns joins us each fall, spring, and summer for three to four months each. Our interns are typically college students, recent graduates, or graduate students. We pay interns, and our hiring process includes steps for equity and inclusion to help ensure diverse hires. There are three aspects of our internship program that I'd like to highlight today. Our program structure, our work with supervisors, and ways we engage interns throughout our organization. First, we're intentional in how we structure our intern program. Prior to recruiting each cohort, each team identifies specific projects with which interns can assist. This allows us to build portfolios for interns and hire to meet our needs. It also gives each team the opportunity to reflect on best ways to engage the interns and ensure that their time will be well spent. We deliberately start the interns in each cohort at the same time. This enables us to realize efficiencies by grouping interns together for onboarding and professional development throughout their term. Additionally, this cohort model provides opportunities for interns to develop relationships with their peers. At the beginning of their term, each intern is assigned a supervisor in the home department, as well as a buddy who is a staff member from a different part of the organization and outside the intern's reporting line. Additionally, we have three intern coordinators who share responsibility for program operations, including professional development and hiring, and service points of contact for the interns. The supervisors, buddies, cohort coordinators, and staff, along with uh, peers in their, inter in their cohort, provide a robust support system that provides interns with multiple resources to help them navigate the organization. To ensure expectations are clear for both the intern and the partnership, each intern develops a learning agreement with their supervisor that codifies the intern's work expectations and professional development interests. The supervisor meets regularly with the intern throughout the term to review work products and to discuss growth opportunities. We provide professional development throughout each intern term. This includes biweekly meetings that provide a space for interns to discuss challenges and present their work to others. They also receive a training on a variety of skills needed in a professional development setting, professional setting such as note-taking, Excel, and networking. The second topic I would like to discuss is the focus on our supervisors. We understand that supervisors need to be equipped to help interns navigate what may be their first professional experience, from managing time to creating a quality work product. We work with supervisors to ensure they have the communication and management skills necessary to engage interns in a meaningful way. We train supervisors to provide effective feedback that includes completing performance assessments. Our supervisors meet monthly with intern coordinators and HR staff to engage, exchange ideas, and receive program updates. By ensuring supervisors are well-equipped to provide interns with a quality experience, they develop leadership skills that far outlast any intern term. My third point focuses on integrating interns into the life of the organization. Though interns are with us just a short time, welcoming them as team members in our organization has many benefits. Each cohort meets with members of our C-suite and we encourage supervisors to help their interns set up informational interviews with other staff. We encourage interns to take full advantage of activities and events for the partnership community to get a clear idea of our mission and gain perspective on the value of public service. Some examples of those Activities include participation in service projects and brown bag lunches with our board members. We've redoubled our efforts to keep the community connected as we've worked remotely during COVID. We've scheduled virtual coffees as well as organization-wide activities like virtual bingo and trivia competitions to increase camaraderie. We actively solicit feedback from interns, including a midpoint check-in with the coordinators and HR staff and an exit survey that provides data to drive decision-making as we prepare for the next cohort. By investing in our interns, we develop a talent pipeline that has resulted in several full-time hires. 
Roughly 10% of our current staff started as partnership interns, for example. When our interns are hired someplace other than the partnership, we have created through them a cadre of ambassadors who understand the value of public service and can champion our work and their skill to make a positive difference wherever they go. Thank you for your interest in improving the intern experience wherever that may be. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Ms. Matsumoto. Uh, appreciate your testimony. And uh, last but not least, we are joined by Rod Adams. Mr. Adams is PricewaterhouseCoopers US and Mexico talent acquisition and onboarding leader, and also serves as the co-lead of PwC's Digital Accelerator Program. He's based in Chicago and has 25 years of professional experience beginning in client service before transitioning to human capital. Mr. Adams leads a team that is responsible for hiring more than 15,000 full-time professionals and interns annually. He's focused on driving innovation through PwC's recruiting programs and delivering on PwC's commitment to future-proof the workforce through digital skills training. He spent the majority of his career with PwC in talent acquisition and sourcing and is focused on building a more diverse and inclusive workforce by le leveraging digital tools and disruptive strategies to create authentic, long-lasting relationships with key talent. Mr. Adams, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chairman Timmons, and the other members of the select, the select committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify at the hearing today. Uh, I appreciate uh, this committee's focus in this area of attracting interns as part of the Hill's long efforts to improve staff recruitment, retention, and diversity. I'm honored to have the, the opportunity to share what we do at PwC, our holistic approach and our internship program. So as I said, my name is Rod Adams. I am our US and Mexico talent acquisition and onboarding leader. I uh, have been with the firm for 25 years, started with PwC um, right out of college. So I've been here my entire career. Um, I have been largely focused on and have built expertise in designing and implementing human resource process and strategies um, across the candidate and, and employee life cycle. Uh, PwC uh, is a professional services firm, um, which helps our clients solve problems across a variety of areas in management consulting, tech consulting, audit, tax, as well as other things. Um, throughout my career, I have been passionate about building a diverse and inclusive workforce. Um, you know, at PwC, we strongly believe that inclusive teams composed of people with different cultural backgrounds, perspective, experiences, help us live our purpose. Um, a diverse workforce allows us to solve important business problems and to build trust in society. And our commitment to recruiting diverse talent helps us achieve that goal. So as we said, my team is responsible for hiring uh, close to 15,000 professionals and interns annually. Over the past few years, uh, we've been transitioning um, to a, an increased virtual recruiting approach. Today, all interviews are conducted virtually, first round and second round, and we continue to host more events virtually. Obviously, um, some of this was a result of the realities that were presented to us by COVID-19, but we've been on this journey for multiple years. We started doing interviews virtually before um, the events of the last year and been looking to augment you know, what we do um, to digitally enable how we engage with candidates um, and have invested, you know, around the, around the firm, um, significant amount of money in our digital and technology efforts. So as it relates to hiring, of the 13,000, 15,000 we hire, approximately 5,000 are interns. And we do have three different types of interns um, for our candidates. So I'll, I'll explain each one of those. The first, we call it a start internship. It's for rising, primarily rising juniors, individuals just finishing their sophomore year and rising seniors. It is a, it's a summer internship focused on diversity. So it's diversity. It's uniquely designed for high performing college students who have self-identified as a member of traditionally underrepresented groups, individuals with disabilities or veterans. So the students are selected for an internship and they will, during that internship, learn about our professional services industry. We're really looking to, to get students interested in what we do. They will also have the opportunity to develop professional and technical skills as well that we believe are necessary for the success in the business world um, 
leveraging data analytics skills and things of that nature to solve important problems in a program that we call Skills for Society, which is provides bono, pro bono work for not-for-profit organizations. Last summer, we collaborated with FIRST Robotics to analyze their volunteer data and provide key insights. Um, and that is what the uh, 700 interns who participated in the project were able to do. So projects like, like those help fulfill our purpose, but most more importantly, or just as important, uh, build the key skills in teaming, analytics, storytelling, and data visualization for those interns. Our second internship program, um, also for rising seniors, but in addition to that, students going into a five-year program, as many of the accounting majors we hire, uh, get their master's in accountancy. So it, we call it the advanced internship. Uh, it's our summer internship program provides interns with um, biz the business foundational skills they need to develop, whether they choose to pursue a career at PwC or elsewhere. Uh, they have, they have um, always been an essential part of developing our firm's long-term talent pipeline. So as they do this internship, they are working on actual client engagements. And so they establish the foundation needed for a full-time job following graduation. So approximately 70% of our entry-level associates that we hire come from our internship program, our advanced internship program. And then the third is, is also um, very similar to the advanced internship, but it's specifically for MBA students. They are typically come with prior work experience. And because of that, they are able to take on a higher level of responsibility than our undergrad interns. Um, and most of our MBA interns are in a, our advisory consulting practice. Um, so our, our interns join uh, PwC. They participate in both in-person and virtual training. Um, right now it's all virtual, but typical in-person and virtual training uh, designed to develop their leadership and technical skills. So out of the gates, all interns um, have a training program regardless of which, what type of work they're doing with us. And then our leadership development experience while they're with us, you know, aims to build leaders of the future through, through in the moment coaching. So they get a coach, um, real-time development. They also get what we call a relationship leader. And so as we think about it, just as athletes receive coaching and, and um, uh, adjustments as they play, we want to do the same thing for our PwC professionals. So our interns experience that right out of the gate. They shadow partners um, and employees in addition to doing client assignments. Um, so they're going to work directly with engagement teams and they are able to experience PwC's commitment to our clients, gain valuable insights firsthand. And then to further build relationships across the PwC team, we provide a variety of networking opportunities. So whether that's a chance to do um, a community service project with other interns and staff, um, a chance to do a lunch and learn, um, just a, a ton of opportunities for the interns to one, get together with one another in network and then also network with our professionals. So, you know, with that, our workforce in the makeup in the United States, as we all know, is changing. The skills needed are evolving. Uh, it's important. We believe it's important to design an internship to build on the skills that the students are developing in school to really um, hone those skills and, um, you know, provide that real world element to it. So thank you for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Mr. Adams. Uh, we will head into member questions and I'll um, recognize myself for five minutes out of the gate. Um, my first question, Ms. Hashimoto, does Idealist have a lot of government postings for internships? And have you seen any congressional office use your service? Maybe discuss how a congressional office like mine would use a jobs and internship posting board? What's, what's the value proposition for a congressional office? How would it Absolutely. improve our applicant pool? How would it help us screen for high quality applicants? Absolutely. It's a, a, thank you for that question. That's a great one. Uh, for sure. I think that we definitely have a good number of uh, opportunities uh, working in the government um, at, at, at various levels. We have um, city parks departments on the site, all the way uh, the state department is also on idealist posting opportunities. So it is a wide variety 
Um, and our, our community is definitely interested in social impact. And we have learned through the years that that really takes so many different forms. They would be interested in working for um, a corporation who's you know, working in, the, in their corporate social responsibility department. Um, so our folks, we have, again, we've surveyed them, had lots of anecdotal conversations, and they're sort of interested in, again, a wide um, range of opportunities. And I think sometimes it's about just not knowing. And so on our site in particular, there are lots of nonprofit opportunities, but you know, we're, we're offices, for example, we're member offices to be posting. I have no doubt there'd be interest there. Um, I know some of the positions that come up often in, in your offices, for example, like a communications position or a chief of staff position, those are absolutely sort of common in the nonprofit sector. And I guess it sort of depends on, on the member office to sort of say what skills they're looking for. And I would hope, um, you know, someone coming with varied experience in the nonprofit sector, in the for-profit sector would be kind of a great addition to an office. I think they'd probably be able to bring a lot of, of what they've learned and then sort of, um, you know, come in and bring something um, hope, hopefully new and hopefully fresh. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think it's another thing too, is just even that uh, exposure in front of our community. So whether you're, you know, looking to attract uh, candidates in DC or, or in your district office, I think it's just another great way to get, uh, get in front of people. And we also offer volunteer opportunities as well. So that's sort of another thing. If there are opportunities with your offices, again, in either location, I think that's another way to, to get in front of um, a lot of people. Yeah, a, a, about a million or so a month. Let me ask um, Mr. Adams or, or Ms. Matsumoto. So you know, our committee has the opportunity to make recommendations to make Congress work better. So what? Give us a first step that Congress ought to take to ensure a high quality intern program that that actually creates educational value for its participants across every congressional office. You know, what would you do? Is it a, is it training the intern managers? Is it creating a shared curriculum? Is it a resource office for interns? Is it something else? Give us some advice. Would you like me to sure to take go a first, swing. Amika? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think a number of things that I would suggest in no particular order. I, I do think that 100% having a deliberate approach that is somewhat centralized is important. We, as I've been in my role, there was a time where we were very decentralized in our approach. So what we looked for, how we trained, you know, how we set up, you know, the, the connectivity around interns varied from group to group. And, and we made a conscious decision that we wanted to create a consistent experience. So starting with training, depending on what type of job they're coming in, regardless of where they are, obviously we're a national firm, regardless of where they are, they're going through the exact same training at the exact same time at the beginning of their internship to position them to be able to do the work that we're asking them to do. So having that consistent training program, I would recommend uh, their support network is set up the exact same way. So they get a buddy, they get a coach, they get a relationship leader, and then they're kind of in a pod of six to eight interns within the team that they're working with, with that coach relationship leader and buddy. And that is their support team for the full eight weeks that they're with us over the summer. Those individuals are helping them from a learning perspective, but just also helping them figure out how to navigate, you know, PwC and, and corporate America. So I do think that that is important. And then the last thing I'll point out, I'll turn it over, is um, I know on the first panel, there was a lot about paid internships. Our internships are, are paid and clearly support that, but the, there are benefits outside of a paid internship that we that really resonate, that we see and hear from our interns. Um, we've got, as an example, um, as a part of our training, they have the opportunity to earn badges. So there's training that they can do where they can learn, they can earn a, a digi digital visualization badge, for example. That goes with them, right? So they're now able to put that on Handshake or wherever it is where they're being recruiting and shown that they've got, they learned, they got a skill that they learned as part of their internship. That's a benefit that we've gotten a lot of traction from, as well as they're so focused on it. I know just by doing a, a an internship with you, they're kind of demonstrating this, but they're so focused on giving back. So having opportunities during our internship where they can give back to the community and do it together. And it's a, it's a connectivity opportunity as well as an opportunity to, to have an impact socially um, means a lot to them as well. Um, Ms. Matsumoto, I may come back to you. I wanna give my colleagues an opportunity to ask questions. And if uh, 
if, if you don't get a chance to weigh in on that, I may, before we wrap, ask you to answer, uh, ask it, answer it as well. Uh, Vice Chair Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this has been really helpful. I, I wanna start with uh, Mr. Adams. Could you talk about the manner in which you track um, gender and racial uh, makeup of your both different levels of people that actually work in your company versus interns versus, and in addition to that, what steps you take to make sure that it is an appropriate makeup uh, gender and race, racially across the spectrum? Does that question make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So, you know, I'll start with what steps we take to make sure it's an appropriate makeup. Um, so first of all, we, we look at, you know, the, the external data points, the pipeline to say, okay, we've got certain skill sets we're hiring. Um, what do, do graduation looks, graduation rates look like, things of that nature, so that we kind of understand, you know, what, are, are we at parity with what exists in the marketplace or exceeding what exists in the marketplace? If not, what do we need to do differently? Um, in that, so it starts with attracting talent, right? And, and I've always been passionate about, we have to get the right talent in the door, diverse talent in the door. So to me, that's a lot about where are you going and how are you articulating your opportunities to different um, individuals of different backgrounds? Because what's, what interest, you know, one, one individual may not be what interests another. Like we're not, we can't, we've, we've got to be personalized in our recruitment approach. So one, where are you going? Um, we, we do have a long list of schools we actively recruit from. We've been deliberate to make sure that list is inclusive. We've got 35 uh, historical black colleges we recruit from, as well as 41 Hispanic serving institutions. We've been deliberate to make sure our list includes those schools, you know, regardless of the school we recruit from, um, even if it's not one of those institutions, engaging with the uh, minority student organizations on campus to sell um, what, what we're looking for in our firm and, our, and our, the value we bring, the career opportunities huge, huge part of our, our efforts. And then as interns, when they come into the door, we recruit them, we get them in the door, you know, how are we connecting them to individuals that have similar backgrounds, interests, look like them is all important. Um, and we make everything available and we, we let the students select, what do I want to get engaged in? So do I want to get engaged with the network, you know, the, um, our black, ne black networking circle, because that's important to me. We don't force it, but if it's something that's important to them, we make it available. And so once they get there, making sure they again have that network and support and they have an opportunity to engage and see people who look like them, have experiences like them, things of that nature. That was really helpful, thank you. So after the internship going all the way up to senior, senior leadership, are, are you taking steps to make sure that the, that the, the proportionality is, is, is appropriate or how does that work? Sorry, I put my I put myself on mute. Um, yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, just give a couple examples. Um, you know, we do believe there, that we need to be deliberate in that space as well. So we have, um, as new hires join, as associates, we have a two year, we call it an onboarding program. Um, we like to name everything, so we've named this Thrive. And it is a program specifically meant for underrepresented minorities to provide them, um, you know, the additional insights, support that they may be interested in or, or need as they're looking to progress. What we've found is the first two years in our organization matter so much. Getting off on the right foot, um, getting the right relationships, getting on the right clients, getting the right experiences matters so much. So we use that program just to have an extra layer of um, certainty that we are getting them those right experiences, getting connected with the, with the right individuals. So that, you know, as an example, that's one of the things that we do, but throughout, you know, so our, our progression is associate, senior associate, manager, director, and then ultimately partner. That's kind of the levels within the firm. And each one of the levels as you progress up there are different interventions that we have um, with the, those that are, uh, in the underrepresented minority groups to 
help shepherd them through that experience and continue to help them be successful and progress through the firm. Thank you for that. And yep. I'm out of time, but at the end, I'm going to come back. And one of the concepts we had earlier in the last panel was that um, Congress should track uh, all of its data for interns and, and beyond. We currently do not have any good tracking system. So I just wanted to hear any of your thoughts on that. I think that we should, probably should be tracking it. Um, so I'll yield back, but we'll circle up on that at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Chair Timmons. Uh, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, look, I'm going to ask you guys uh, some 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 pretty tough questions, candid, uh, and I, 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 you know, thought about it, and I, I think I, you know, I might as well do it so this it can be this can be beneficial. Um, there's a lot being written about Congress and and. Um, the, the, these uh, and these times in which we live and so forth and function um, is the is is Congress a place you think that uh, that that still has an image um, glamorous enough uh, to attract young brilliant uh, people to um, want to uh, be in the mix uh, on this hill surrounded by uh, fencing. Uh, don't don't worry about hurting the feelings of the ch of the chair and the co-chair. Uh, just say it out. Just I I I think it's I think it's important uh, really because I think it, you know we're talking about trying to bring more uh, you know young people in in terms of bright people. And you know, uh, it, 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 when I, when we uh, when I, I, I saw the the um, uh, title of our hearing, I, I thought you know we need to really f go down and to the roots to find out you know just how attractive or unattractive we are. Uh, Sashimoto, anybody who wants to go first? I mean, don't be sure. uh, don't be too eager because I you know. To hurt our feelings. No, I'll 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 take it, and I appreciate that question. And um, it's a it's a great note. I actually I thought that was going to be about the pandemic. I think perhaps it was a little bit, but not totally. And um, that's a, that's a sobering question, and I think it's a good one. My, my gut says, my gut says, yes. I mean, I don't know that I'm representing every single, you know, every 1 million of our members, but I think when I think about people who want to make a difference and when I think about where they can do it, uh, this is one of those places. This is literally that happening right now. This is the, you know, this is one more step in, in getting there. And I think, I think, yes. And I think it, talking about this current moment, I know it came up sort of in the, in the first part of the panel, but I think thinking about what it means to be remote right now. And, and again, if we're talking about safety of any sort, uh, I think it's a, it's a great note to consider what it means to be remote. And I, and I share the sentiments that I heard before. I think these learning experiences are much better in person. But I think where they can be, uh, where they can be accommodated, I think it's incredible because you know we know what's going on. Uh, folks working remotely, it's bringing up accessibility issues where folks who maybe could not get to a physical office or could not work in that space uh, couldn't afford to you know to get to DC. Um, all of a sudden, that's that's changing, and so I think this ability to have remote opportunities where possible, as much as possible, I think can be really um, powerful. I, I do think it's hard, of course, and I think it takes a lot more um, I think it takes a lot more process ahead of time and a much more codified to get there. But I think that there's uh, lots of different ways to do it. So I think, again, that can make these opportunities more accessible. And I, I hope that there's still glamour for people. I know there a young Emily there sure was um, at the I didn't actually intern in the Hill, but um, interning in DC was definitely a dream. So just to say, I think for all the Emily's out there, I think um, there's probably still some shine if I had to guess. Okay. I'm interested, uh, Matsumoto. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a great question, and I think it's something that uh, is true for many of our institutions. There's uh, kind of what we, you know, what we think of an institution, or what we think of in this case, a, a specific member um, of, of Congress. I think there are um, a number of ways people want to make a difference. There's a number of ways people believe that change is possible, and they want to be a part of that change. So I think there's a sense of, you know, to what extent can 
um, as you recruit, be intentional in helping people understand the difference that they can make uh, individually and as part of uh, this institution. Um, I, I think there is genuine hope out there and people have tremendous skills and talent and they want to use that to drive change. And um, I think there's, there are a few places where people can make national scale type of change um, and Congress is one of them. So I, there may be some challenges certainly in, in the different types of perspectives that someone may have, but I think there's a genuine belief that uh, this is a place to go if you want to be able to, to make a difference on such a grand scale. Um, so I do think there are many people who still think this is something they want to do. And I think to the point of equity and other things that happened earlier, you know, spoke of earlier, that there are a lot of people who do want to serve and for them to be able to have a way to do that, you know, be able to do so um, is a, you know, financially to be able to do so because they can navigate the system um, and figure out how to apply. I think all those things certainly come into play, but I, I, I do believe, and I don't think it's just a hope that, that people really do want to serve and that that's something that's been true uh, for generations and certainly true for the current one as well. I think my time is up, but uh, I wanted to uh, get to, to Mr. Adams at, at some point. I can talk, talk to him maybe offline. Thank you very much. That, that's very helpful uh, to me uh, and, certain, and not as painful as I thought, but I appreciate your candor. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first question is for you, Mr. Adams. Uh, intrigued by the different, how you create different internship programs uh, for different constituencies. Uh, you know, curious about um, any, sp any key learnings that you might share with us about the, I can't remember the name, but for the underserved yep. uh, communities uh, internship program that you have, you referenced that 70% of your new associates come from uh, the other program. You know, do some of those from the underserved program make it to, to associates? What have you learned? What are some of the challenges? What might we take from that, uh, that, that experience? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank hey, how are you, my friend? Congressman Cleaver. I'm sorry, Mr. Other... Cleaver, you got to mute. There we go. <laughs> he didn't know his time it... was exp... <laughs> <laughs> The mute button gets someone on every call, right? It's yeah. just the way it happens. So um, I, I thank you for asking that question. So absolutely, our our internship programs are all built to, to kind of build on each other and ultimately end up in full time. So that program, the START program for the underrepresented exists um, because we're looking to, at the heart of it, we want to get more uh, students interested in what we do. So we built that program as a means to introduce them to the profession. So we're pretty open with the, the majors because, you know, they're young in their college careers at that point yeah. that we look for because we want, we want, you know, it, we want to build interest in what we do, hopefully change people to choose computer science or accounting or one of the things that we are interested in or that we're hiring. So that, that is what it's about, all about. We look at it to be a feeder. So to specifically ask your, answer your question, um, about 60% of the individuals that participate in our START program end up staying with us for multiple summers and starting with us full time after they graduate. Um, and so it's a, it is, it is a, a very important program for us. We had 700 interns in it last year. We're gonna have a thousand this summer. Um, and so it, it is, that is the ultimate goal for them to, to for us to retain them and move them forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, you know, this, this next proposition is a little bit out of left field, but I would love your action. And Ms. Matsumoto, maybe uh, starting with you, but my office takes advantage of a lot of fellowship programs, uh, Wounded Warriors and Wrangell Fellowships. Uh, we have a Pearson Fellow soon to start, uh, and they've been extraordinary blessings uh, um, uh, to me, to our team, uh, and I think it goes both ways. Yeah, I, it makes me wonder though, uh, why doesn't Congress have an opportunity for congressional staffers to have uh, fellowships in the executive branch, uh, work in an embassy for six months, uh, uh, work in one of the agencies so that we can actually have some cross fertilization uh, of those experiences too, instead of just having talent from the administration or executive branch go back to the executive branch. Any, any thoughts on on that, if you think it would uh, be smart, uh, if it could even work, I would love your thoughts on that, uh, Ms. Matsumoto. Thank you, uh, it's a great question. I do think there are a lot of ways we benefit from talent exchanges and from being yeah. able to learn how different things work. 
um, being able to form relationships with folks in different parts of um, uh, different organizations. So I, I think there are, there are opportunities out there. I think there are examples, perhaps not an exact one that, that you mentioned, but there are several different types of fellowship programs where there are talent exchanges um, that occurs both public and private sector. I think it occurs with in the public sector, um, different ways. Um, you have the you know, the IPA program. There's just so many different things that have happened. So um, it, it's a great idea. I think it's something that uh, you know, we certainly would be happy to talk to you about further in ways that uh, we could see that working or, or how that um, has transpired in other ways. And we could take some of the best practices in other situations to bring it there. But the talent exchange concept is, is really important and one that allows for people to uh, really develop better understanding and uh, further skills as well. Yeah, any, any other comments, uh, Ms. Hashimoto or uh, Mr. Adams? Okay. Um, you know, Mr. Adams, just to go back to you quickly about, uh, yeah. back, back to the, the internship program that I referred to, I, I just, I really wanna, is there anything that you've learned that surprised you or that PwC has been surprised by uh, in terms relative to the recruitment, um, what the difference makers are uh, between those that succeed, those that don't? Any, anything, any nuggets that you might share with us that have been you know, either pleasant surprises or, or unanticipated challenges? Specifically the early internship program or any, just in general? Yeah, the early. I'm, I'm really focused. My focus yeah. is trying to track more economic and racial diversity. Uh, we're yep. fine with geography and politics, and, yep. and and I know how tough that is. You know, just the notion of coming to Washington, even if there is support and money and a place to live. Uh, what, but what do you see as kind of the, the deal makers and the deal breakers in terms of the success? Yeah, so for us, uh, I could give you my lens. Um, again, a lot of what we do is, a, is accounting. For us, awareness of what we do and why we do it and just like what the profession is. Like there is just... We, we have to spend a lot of time on the education early in college career. We start with minority um, offices on campus as early as, as freshmen to really introduce them to what we do because there's a lack of understanding and awareness. So that has been, you know, it's not a surprise anymore. It's been that way since I've been here, but it, it has been an obstacle that we've had to overcome. So getting to students early, selling them early on before they've locked in on a major on you know, what it is that we do so that they start to think about our profession has been something we've had to put a lot of effort and energy in, in a, in, at, a at a level and um, a level of depth and, and deliberateness with underrepresented minorities that we don't have to do with the majority. It, 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 it doesn't, we don't require that with the majority. There's just more of awareness of what we do. So that's probably been our biggest, biggest obstacle um, to overcome. I appreciate it. My time is well expired. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, great conversation and, and appreciate your insights. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, make sure that we give folks a opportunity if they have uh, questions that weren't asked of uh, this panel. I know Mr. Timmons, you, Vice Chair Timmons, you had one. Go ahead. Sure. Um, you know, currently there's a lot of debate over what the actual data is. I mean, the, the, the best data that we've had, the methodology to obtain that data is painstakingly difficult and it, it essentially involves interns using social media and or Google to try to figure out the socioeconomic and or, you know, gender race of a person. So uh, I guess my question is, can we, does anyone think that we shouldn't be tracking this stuff? Like, I don't understand. Can, do, let me start here. Do, do all of you track this as a part of due course of, of your businesses? And what are your thoughts on whether Congress should also track it? Anybody wants to jump in, but I'd like to hear from, from each of you briefly. I'll, I'll jump in briefly just to say uh, at Idealist with our hiring, it, uh, we are not tracking that information. We are tracking it other ways. And I will say we're slow to it. I think we've had some reticence, perhaps that's a shared thing of, of feeling like uh, we don't want to ask, we want to make it really candidate forward. But I think that these 
this data matters. And so um, we're actually doing things as we build products, we are asking for that information, obviously anonymized, private, you know, shipped to a different database. I mean, we're being really careful about our management of this data. Um, but but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say one thing that comes to mind. I think about the ways that some of our nonprofits are starting to track data with applicants. So that's when they track it, they track it right then. They take it again, it's anonymized, it's not connected to the candidate profile, but it is a way to get whatever you're looking for. So this way, and, and of course it's optional, I guess that's also important to say, but you know, you're asking for race and ethnicity, you're asking for um, uh, gender, gender uh, expression, you know, whatever sort of feels right, veteran status, per people with disabilities. And so I think it can really be um, whatever it needs to be. And hopefully some of that data, again, not, not attached to the candidate, but hopefully even just having that in aggregate could probably be pretty powerful. Uh, we, we do track uh, applicant data as well. Um, to Mr. Hammer's point, we, we don't uh, connect that to a specific candidate. So hiring managers don't see that, for example, but from an HR perspective, uh, we do have that. And we uh, do look at our data over time to understand, you know, are people making it through the process? Are we losing uh, certain demographics in, in certain ways and what might be causing that um, if that's the case? So we do look at, at data, it does help inform uh, our process to make sure we are equitable, you know, are we thinking about inclusion in different ways? Um, it, you know, it, it's been very helpful. Um, I do say it is, it is a challenge, I think, to track data. Our software allows us, you know, from an applicant tracking um, system to, to be able to track that. Um, it's not something that everybody may have, so it does certainly provide some challenges if somebody doesn't have access to that. Um, and we've been really intentional in how we use it, where we disclose it, um, how we use it to, to drive decision making throughout. So it is something that I think is, is valuable. But I think there's got to be a really um, clear understanding of how that data is used and uh, you know, to do something that can improve a process and not necessarily be tied to a specific candidate that, that might have an impact that way. I, I don't think I can say it any better than she just did. It, our approach is exactly the same. We do, we do have the data, we track it to improve decision making, but it is not aligned to uh, a candidate in any way, shape, or form. It is totally, what, it, what one of Amiko or Emily said it, it's totally um, optional on whether, you know, an a, a applicant decides to give it to us. But we do have the data and, and help helps so we can look at it in the aggregate and help us make decisions on where, you know, we, we need to intervene, where we need to have training um, and, and things of the like. So, yeah. Thank you all, Mr. Chairman, yield back. I'd love to ask um, Ms. Matsumoto, you know, we have folks managing interns who were interns not too long ago, and a lot of folks um, in that role don't have management experience. So any advice as to what our committee could recommend with regard to training the trainers? What does the curriculum look like for managers of interns? That's a great question, and it's something that we've thought a lot about. Um, in a similar situation, many of our more entry-level staff also supervise interns. Um, it's a great opportunity for them to develop leadership skills and, and management skills, and I think there's additional uh, focus on the fact that they're also learning in, you know, in, in experiencing the workplace themselves. So um, we have done a couple different things to, to help train and equip our supervisors. Um, we do have a session before they start for the intern start where the supervisors will meet. Um, they learn about things, um, some things kind of operational, how to approve timesheets and approve leave and, and things like that. Um, but also things like how to provide productive feedback, how to effectively delegate. Um, you know, so we do gather them, have a chance for them to talk and learn with uh, and from one another in advance. And then we have them meet kind of throughout the intern term to be able to discuss that with their peers, exchange ideas. Hey, I'm having a hard time with my intern um, speaking up in meetings. You know, what else have people done to help encourage their intern to be you know, more participatory? You know, so th those sorts of questions we can, we can get at um, and provide a space for them to really explore. Um, so that's something that, that we have done. We have, and to your, a little bit to your question earlier as far as how to start this, we looked across the organization to find out what other, what teams were doing and what was working well and how we could replicate that. So there were some things where we didn't have to completely start something all over again. It was, hey, this is working really well. How do we replicate that? How do we expand that so that other teams might have that same 
uh, sort of opportunity. Um, and that's been true for our supervisors as well. Um, we do have folks who are happy to talk with them, you know, help them you know, troubleshoot or you know, kind of explore different, uh, different topics as they're kind of coming into their own in supervision. Uh, but we have been incredibly intentional to work with our supervisors so that they're prepared. Um, it's something that's, uh, it, it takes a little bit of time on the front end, but the, on the back end, there is all kinds of ways in which that, uh, that pays off. So it, uh, it's something that we certainly recommend. Just looking to see if any of my colleagues have any further questions. Mr. Phillips, you had anything? Okay, well, I wanna thank our witnesses for their testimony today. Um, I also wanna thank our uh, very talented staff uh, of this committee. This hearing was put together quickly and it's a testament to their hard work that it went so smoothly and we had so many talented witnesses. Um, I'd also like to thank Mr. Phillips for sharing his intern ID badge, um, which was certainly one of the highlights of my day. Just out of solidarity, I will share my internship photo from 1993. Um, I'm not sure what is more embarrassing, how large my trousers are in that photo or how large my hair is. Uh, but um, I wanna thank all of you for your participation. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which we will uh, forward to the witnesses for their response. And I would certainly ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everybody.